Bonjour tout le monde. Yeah. Uh, okay, let's talk a little bit about React and how we use React to rebuild one of our social plugins, and you'll see in a second what that means. Um, I wrote this thing a couple of months ago. Uh, I have a few free copies, so if there is time at the end, whoever asks a question gets a free book. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, I, I work at Facebook, but not on React. I work with React, so if you have anything bad to share that you don't like about React, I'm not going to get offended. <laughs> I'm gonna enjoy. Um, so this is the plan for today. I know there's a lot of options. It can be sound, look a little bit confusing when you get started, but uh, let's not panic. Uh, talk a little bit about the comments plugin and just in general how we use JavaScript at Facebook. So things are moving fast, right? React is moving fast. JavaScript is moving fast, right? We have ECMAScript 6 now, 2015, 2016, and things are happening. And also the JavaScript community, right? We have all these amazing tools uh, popping up all the time. So at some point, when you try to get started with something, say, OK, I get drowned with all these options and all these buzz. What am I going to do? First thing is, right, don't panic. Um, it's a good idea to start with something small um, and local. So the, the first ever React application was, uh, you know, when you have a, a post in Facebook and there's a little comment section where you can like stuff, um, react to things, and, and write comments and replies. So this was the, the very first uh, React application. So uh, obviously we couldn't stop the world and rewrite the whole Facebook.com from scratch. Um, so the React was designed to, um, from day one, to be able to plug into uh, certain areas that are maybe a little bit more dynamic than the rest. Um, so you can gradually uh, rewrite bigger chunks of your applications. Uh, a quick word about the separation between applications and documents, right? Um, uh, documents, it's how the web was designed initially. Uh, content HTML with some styling eventually, and um, some JavaScript that provides the behavior. And apps are a little bit different because there's not a, usually a whole lot of content in there, but they're more dynamic, they change all the time. So React is not the best tool for everything. Um, so as I said, you can start, let's say if you have a blog post, keep that in uh, old school HTML, not a web app, but a document, but then maybe do uh, the comment section with React or some, some other part of the app that uh, updates often. So what is the, the comments plugin? Uh, let me show you quickly. Um, let's say you go to uh, some website that uses our plugin. See, uh, So there's an article, and at the bottom there, there uh, should be somewhere. A comments plugin. Yeah, nobody has commented already. So this is our third-party commenting solution that anyone can can put on their website. Uh, and as you can expect, it's you can write comments. Um, you can also post to Facebook. See this thing? I don't know if you can see. Oops. Um, some things change as you type. You can do well, let's say tag somebody. Uh, you can change your identity if you have, uh, let's say you're managing an app, like your band's website. Uh, you can comment as that. Um, post comments. See, this, this, this thing updates already. This is one component. This is another one. There's a third one. You can like your own stuff. <laughs> <laughs> or just remove it. So in, in addition to that, there is also a comments moderation tool. Um, let me show you something a little bit. Uh, let's see, on our developer side, there is um, this sort of configuration thing where you can set up your plugin. Um, and uh, as you can see, there is quite a little bit more content here. Uh, and there's a link to a moderation tool so in this moderation tool, you can uh, you can filter out the, the stuff. I mean, there's some things that are automatically flagged, right? Because they have some words that you don't want. Hey, yeah. Um, 
Yeah, you, you can mass moderate things, um, approve, hide. Uh, this is your public thing. A flag tab. Uh, so th this little thing, let me show you quickly. So this is a, let's say this is the container and the app was rendered in between here. So this, this thing is not part of the app, neither is the footer. Oh, that's a lot of comments. Um, um, but you can uh, interact with the app like this. So in effect, this is a, these are two, uh, yeah, the, the moderator can, can do things here and undo, undo as well. Uh, as you can see, there's really two apps. Uh, one is for moderation uh, for the site owners, and the other one is for um, uh, for the people to comment. Right, front end and the moderation tool. So two apps we, we launched at the F8 conference. Um, it only took a couple of months, really, a few months to build up, and um, it wasn't the. I don't know if there was anybody full-time dedicated to it, but just people coming and going. Um, at this point, uh, some of them without any JavaScript knowledge or without any React knowledge at all. Um, and a trend that we notice is that uh, they tend to be a little bit happier than other developers when they work with React. So people come in and say, oh, now I see what Auto Love is about because it's true pleasure. Um, so of course we didn't build absolutely everything from scratch. So the back end was there. Uh, it didn't help that it was also being refactored. Um, there was the, the comments on the facebook.com site that I tried to reuse, but they were not really built because it was the very first React app. You can uh, probably guess that it wasn't the greatest. Um, and uh, yeah, there were some, some, uh, some components that we could use uh, that we didn't have to write, let's say, this thing that um, the autocomplete, um, say this is one uh, drop-down component that we could use. Um, so yeah, we, we didn't review everything uh, from scratch, so that's why maybe it took a little <laughs> bit less time. And uh, we wanted to organize uh, the code base well, so we heard about this thing called Flux, but at this point there was no implementation other than just a blog post with some diagrams. Uh, so we did it ourselves. Um, and that's something that I usually am a fan of, um, that, um, of building things yourself, because then you understand what's going on, and then, then you know when you're evaluating another tool, let's say Redux or something else that you want to use, then you know what, uh, what's going on, you know how to make the best informed decision. Um, so, flux was all on us. Uh, so, when, when building an app, what, what, what's an app exactly? Uh, and I'd like to think of two things. One is the app is uh, composed from uh, little components, and those components can communicate somehow with each other. So, um, adding a new comment increments a counter, uh, which are completely separate components. So let's see, um, how do you go about building a component? Uh, in React, components are um, responsible for rendering some data, right? It's sort of a blue, blueprint, uh, and you, you give this component some data, it knows how to render. And eventually when the data changes, it knows how to, it, it's basically the same thing. It already created, uh, rendered this data once, and if the data changes, there's no more work to be done, or that happens behind the scenes. And then the components, other than rendering data, they can listen to, to anything happening in the app, usually from a, the user, but it could be some events happening from the server, or maybe just the passage of time, something happens, and they should know how to react to that. Some best practices when, when creating new components, small is better, right, more manageable. Uh, small surface, meaning don't expose too many properties, don't make it too configurable, because then the thing is, one, once you put something out there, it's kind of hard to take back, and people will use it and rely on it, and it's kind of hard to test all these combinations. Seems like a, like a function, right? If the function takes zero or one or two arguments, that's good. If it takes 10, then it's almost impossible to test all those combinations. 
Uh, components can manage their own state if they need it. Uh, and it's always a good idea to strive for not managing state, but just make them as simple as they can be. So this is our MVC, or the minimum viable component, the smallest bit that really works. Um, so you start by creating a new component like this with React Create class, and the only thing that you need to implement is that render function. Uh, that render function spits out some UI. Um, you have access to these props, which is all the properties that are passed to your component when it was created. If you think of a simple uh, href, right, a is the, the anchor tag is your component and the href is the, is the property that you use to configure your component. So uh, you have access to, to all those little properties and then you have uh, a bag of children which is anything inside of your component. So then how, how do you use this? Uh, let's say you create, this is your overall app and it wants to use this new slide component. So this, of course, this is done in React, this whole presentation. So this is a, a slide component and it has a title and it has some children as uh, content. All right, so we configure the title and then we put anything in there. Uh, and if you look back at the implementation, we put the title in an H1 and the children, we don't want to know about them. Anything goes. Ah, word on JSX. So may maybe if you're not familiar, you saw this thing that is, I mean, this is JavaScript, but uh, in the middle of it, there is this little things that look like HTML, XML. First time React was announced, there was a big backlash and oh my God, what's this XML happening here? So um, this is completely optional technology. You don't have to use it. In, you can define and use components using pure JavaScript. But um, once you try it, you don't go back. Um, it's a basically very lightweight transform from, from the component name and properties to JavaScript calls. Initially, there was a utility called JSX, um, JavaScript X. Extendable, extended, nobody knows. It's not even on the website. Uh, so this utility is not shipped as part of React anymore, but um, now we use Babel to do all those transformations. Um, these days in ECMAScript 6 world, um, you can use classes to define those components. They extend the, the React component thing in, and then they define render method just as before. Um, so th this part really could stay the same. There is also something called a stateless functional component. If, if your component is simple enough that it doesn't need to maintain state and it only implements a render function, uh, then uh, you can define it using this syntax, which says I take all the properties that are passed to me, I don't worry about state, um, and then I, uh, the return of this function is the same as implementing the render method. Uh, only in this case, I don't have this props because there's no such, I mean, this here refers to the window probably, global object. Um, so you use props title, props children. So there's some newer syntax that could look a little foreign. It's a, again, a stateless functional component that has a destructuring assignment, right? So instead of taking a props object, it uses this destructuring assignment to get two variables called title and content. Uh, there's an implicit return, this is an error function. Um, I mean, this is how it looks like JavaScript, so, so much different than, than what we wrote just a few years ago. Um, but at the end, if you, if you paste this into the Babel um, online tool, you get something like this, where it's old school JavaScript with bars and returns. And, and this is how those components that use the JS syntax turned into regular JavaScript functions. So basically, JSX saves you the trouble of doing React Create Element, React Create Element, keeping track of all the brackets and um, parentheses and all that stuff. Right, state. Um, this was, these were some examples of uh, stateless components. Um, but as some of the components leave on, things start to happen. In this case, we have a slide component and we have a list component. 
this list was initially initialized with two elements, uh, but this component can take more. So you can say, right, um, right, um, and update this thing, or then you can say, bonjour. Right, so the state of this, this list component changed. So let's see how this is done. Um, okay, the first thing is you have to implement this method called get initial state so that the, the component always initializes with some same data. Uh, in this case, uh, we read the initial properties that were sent. Uh, and then, then you go about your business creating a form, uh, uh, an ordered list, and then JSX allows you to open those curly brackets and, and, uh, and use uh, any old JavaScript in there, any variables, in this case, uh, array map loop that takes each item and puts it in there. And then when something changes, when the form is submitted or, or in this input you, you write something, then we, we need some way to handle the change. Um, and this is really simple, right? You take you take the items that you know. Uh, you read them from the from the current state. Um, th this event uh, gives you uh, the new data. Yeah. So this is the thing about React. It uses uh, the so-called synthetic events. So um, they're they're just like W3C events, only they work in every browser, and there are a few little additions to them. But uh, you you no longer have to do oh is this uh, window.event in IE or whatever it is. So you can always be sure that the, the event handlers take an event object that has a target um, and proceed. So let's say here we massage the, the data somehow and then we call set state with, with, the, new, with the new array of items. Um, as soon as set state is called, React re-renders your component. Uh, so which means it calls the render function once again. And at this time, the state has one more item, so it, it renders it with the, with the new additional item. Um, and of course, there's a lot of um, work behind the scene to make sure that um, th those changes don't, don't happen instantly, though you don't cause too many reflows. If you were this morning at the React performance talk, uh, there was some really good information about this. Uh, but basically, this is a queue of changes and then uh, React computes the minimum amount of DOM manipulation to apply those changes. Um, all right, uh, if, you, if you're going to use the, uh, the class syntax from uh, ECMAScript 6, uh, there is no get initial state, but you initial in your constructor, then you initialize the state with um, whatever you want. Now, there's the, the concept of uh, the so-called pure components, and these are components that uh, use nothing but state and properties to render. Um, we'll see how, in, uh, an example just in a second. So sometimes people are confused what state, what's properties, when should they use one, when should they use the other. So if you, if you draw a sort of an analogy with object-oriented programming, the props uh, properties are things that you pass to your constructor once you initialize it. And the state is something that your, your little class maintains and uses for its own purposes. Uh, so state is private and props is how you configure. All right, enough about components. How, how, how do these little separate components, some of them with state, some of them just stateless, how do they talk to each other? Um, the easiest is from a parent to a child, you can use properties, so whenever the parent something in the state of the parent changes, uh, the, the render function is called again, so there's a chance for the parent to reconfigure the properties of the child and propagate any changes. For all others, um, child to, um, to a parent, let's say, you can add more properties that are sort of like event handlers. So your child can say if something changes, I'm gonna call this callback if the parent was kind enough to provide it. Um, or you can use some sort of event. So um, let's say you have a um, parent with two children, and one of the children has two grandchildren. So how, how are these going to talk to each other? The simplest thing is from the parent to a child using properties. Um, so we initialize this, this parent 
uh, with the state, so the parent can be either tired or not tired. Um, so um, we we add a button to the, to the to the parent that can toggle that state of tiredness or not. Um, and the only thing that happens is when when you click that button, we change the state of the parent. We toggle the state of the parent. So if it wasn't tired, then it becomes tired. And how this propagates to the child? There it is. You can you have the property if the child is watching TV. Uh, so whenever the parent is tired, we set this thing to true, and the child can start watching the program. Um, so what about the the child? How how does the child send a, send a message to the parent? Um, in this case, one of the options was to use more more. Uh, more properties, right? In this case, there's a mood swing, on mood swing change property that the parent can can handle somehow. Um, and then, if uh, if th this uh, callback is called, and if the the mood of the child is gone from bad to worse, and it's a negative, then the the parent can decide to dispense some more candy. And the state of uh, of the parent has one candy less. Uh, that also requires the child to cooperate. All right. So the child, when it renders, it renders something, some adorableness, and then when you, w then you have an, some sort of action, right? Another button. Uh, and if the kid is watching a, a movie that features dogs, the the these inevitably have some sad parts, right? So, um, then if if the parent has provided a mood swings callback, then it's going to be called with the new delta, right? So, but that's a little bit of work, right? So you have to check this thing all the time, uh, and if the parent doesn't provide anything to listen to, then nothing really happens. Um, so that that explains parent to child and child to parent. But uh, how about siblings? How can siblings communicate? Uh, neither of them created the other one, so they don't know anything about each other. So maybe they can use. Some, uh, they can ask the parent, let's say, if you want to say something to your sister, then you tell the parent, and the parent tells them what to do. Um, that sounds really very elegant. Uh, the same thing with, with grandchildren, right? Uh, because the parent hasn't constructed the grandchildren, then the grandchild has to tell their parent, and their parent has to tell their parent. Again, gets uh, complicated quickly. You end up with a long list of, of, uh, of properties uh, if this happens, if that happens, or propagate this to, to your children and so on. Uh, it's kind of hard to maintain um, the single source of truth at this point. So maybe we can use some sort of events. Um, that should be better, right? So that's where the idea of flux comes in. Um, this is a way to, uh, it's just kind of an idea. There's no, there's no standard implementation that I know of. Um, uh, this is just a way to manage one-way data flow. It uses store actions and dispatcher in this this sort of. Um, so the view is your is your component. Uh, it takes it reads data from the store. Uh, for simple purposes, you can even um, remove the dispatcher. It's not needed. So whenever something happens, the data in the store is is uh, updated, and then the view or the component reads from the new data from the store, and um, responds somehow. So then something might happen, right? You have a button inside of your component that causes another action, and it's sent to the store, and so on and so forth. But it's always, it's always uh, the data flows in one direction. So um, let's see how we can change this slide component. Instead of taking up a whole bunch of properties, then maybe it can go to the store. And so we see how the store is implemented, and say, hey, I, I just need to be implemented with, uh, with an ID. Um, and given that idea, I can go to the store and get everything that I need, like text, um, everything that I need to render. And if something happens, uh, then I call this uh, central place that contains all, the, all these actions. Uh, so the actions will update the store, and then the component will update as well. All right, the actions, they update the data in the store. And once this happens, the store emits an event, and the component can listen to this event and respond by re-rendering or doing something. Um, 
So the store can be a simple, very, very the, the simplest uh, JavaScript object that provides get and set method and emits an event if something happens. So there's this, this library called mixing event limit emitter, which is really simple. It, you mix it into any object, the ability to subscribe to events and fire events. Um, so mixing in uh, the store pr provides this emit function. Uh, so the actions, let's say when something happened in that slide, we call this, uh, this method. So it does something with the data and sets the new data in the store. So we have action store view or the component. Um, so how does the component know that something changed? The, the simplest thing is at the very top level of the app, you, you just listen to, to the store, uh, to any change events, and then you call this thing called force update, which is the same as set state, and it forces all the components in the tree to, uh, to re-render. So as we heard from this morning's talk, this is probably not the best, the best way, um, not the most efficient way, but for a whole lot of applications, and especially when you start with uh, prototyping something that's more than enough. So whenever something happens, we force the update, which causes all the render methods of all the children to be called. Um, mentioned about pure render functions. So in this case, our slide component is no longer pure because inside of the render function, it goes to the store and reads some data. Um, so it doesn't only rely on properties in state anymore, but it, it relies on data coming from a function call. Uh, how do we make it pure? Uh, we make sure that the render function only reads from its own state. And we maintain the state, um, this component maintain its own state instead of reading from the store every time. So it, uh, it reads uh, during the initialization and then uh, renders as usual. And then when the, uh, when the change event occurs, then it can listen, instead of relying on the, on the whole app updating every single thing, then you can listen to change or more specific events specific to this uh, component and then call its own set state with the new data, which causes the render function to be called and at this point the state is already updated. So the render method is pure again. All right, types. I wanted to quickly mention this, how, how they evolved. Um, not everybody loves types, especially in JavaScript world. Douglas Crockford comes to mind, but um, there's a lot of people that like them, like them. Um, so um, we move from runtime events to um, React prop types to flow. So the runtime checks that we used to have were development time transform. So as you develop, um, we transpile the script and add these little checks at the top of every function and reads whatever this property is supposed to be and, uh, and checks during development if it is or not. In production, you strip all those and there's no more checks. Um, and then React came about uh, and it has these prop types where instead of, um, as in my old previous examples, um, I didn't take care of checking what type of property are passed to those components, but you can do that by implementing the prop types property. And then you can say, okay, my component can only take a name that is string and it's always required, or it can take an array of numbers that is required, or some optional size, which can be only one of the two. Uh, there's even shapes, or, or if, if your component takes an object, then you check for specific properties inside of this object. And there's a lot of those React prop types you can inspect. Um, so then flow, um, you've probably heard of TypeScript. Um, flow is a, is an um, optional technology. Again, you sign up by, by adding this comment that says flow, and then um, um, flow, which is an uh, offline transforms, um, kicks in and checks if um, whatever you provided, whatever you marked up makes sense, All right? So it's a static code analyzer. Uh, so you can, you can type in your arguments and your returns 
from the function. You can also have custom types again. Um, let's say you have um, your your function takes a takes an object. You can say these are the properties that I want in my object. Uh, and not everything has to be defined in the same file, but there is the the concept of having separate files that were just definitions, and you can import them and use them um, when you write code. So if you haven't, uh, go try flow, play with it, uh, see how it looks like. You can start by by adding add flow to only specific files, and then um, if you like it, you can gradually rewrite the whole application to do um, type checks. All right, how, how does a typical file looks like these days at JavaScript? Um, there's um, one module per file. The module is called with the name of the file so that you you can find it quickly and know what, what it's supposed to do. At the very top, you sign up for flow checks. You say you want to use strict because strict is better than sloppy, right? Uh, so anything that can be um, can be called during development is better. Uh, way at the top, you define all of your uh, requirements, so you don't in, in in the middle of a function you don't say suddenly, oh, I require this thing. All the requires are way, way up at the top, so you have a single place to look at what this module needs. Um, also makes it a little bit easier for the, our packager. And then at the end. Every module named with, uh, with the file name is named after the module, and it exports only one thing, and it's called uh, the same as the module. Um, common pattern to use those destructuring assignments these days. So instead of using React.component, right, when you implement ECMAScript classes, you can just say component. Flow, of course, flow is everywhere. Um, there's also a common pattern of uh, of making sure that uh, all the properties are and state are also typed. So um, usually, the, uh, after your uh, after all the list of all the things that your module requires, you define what type of properties it needs. So this thing replaces React prop types, um, and this is something new that didn't exist before. So you can you can define. Uh, and any users of your module can look at the top and see, oh, okay, this is what I need. Um, and you can also see what type of state this module maintains, and you make sure that it's also typed and always same. So how do you use those two new types that you define in every module? Right? If you have, um, if you use ECMAScript six classes in the constructor that takes properties, you say my properties have to be of the type props that I just defined. Um, if it's a um, uh, if it's a functional component, again the same thing. You can say props of type props. Um, if you have uh, classes like this, you can say that this props always has to be of this type, and this state is also of whatever makes sense. Um, yeah, if you haven't seen this, create React app. Uh, so this is one of the things that. Uh, People in the community were uh, reinventing, and some people were saying, oh, React, I, I need to learn React, but then I need to figure out all these other little things uh, in order to get started. Uh, and there was no official something blessed by Facebook until recently. So now there is this thing called Create React App, and it sets up uh, a lot of things for you. So you don't have to worry about, oh, should I use Gulp or, or Webpack, and all these decisions are made. Uh, it doesn't impose any, any um, uh, Flux implementations, but um, uh, that's up to you still. All right, so um, you f you follow this Saki methodology, which is not a real thing, but my flight was long, so I had to come up with something. Uh, <laughs> so so it, it's reversed. You install, create, amaze when you create the app, and then ship it. <laughs> um, so yeah, that, that's how you install, create app, right? Using npm, and then you create a new app. Uh, Go to that directory and start your server. And whenever you're done, you just run build, and uh, in, in it's all packaged for you nicely. And you can just, uh, just like in the olden times, use FTP to copy to your server. <laughs> uh, let me try to show you something quickly. All right, so th there's a, there is a little app that I've been working on. Uh, 
for this thing. Right. All right, so there, it's, uh, it's an up created by uh, create, create React app. And then all you have to do is do npm start. And it hopefully, eventually, renders the app for you. Uh, so what's really cool is, oh, it also runs lint, JS lint. So you can see that I have problems, which is good to know. All right. um, let's see if I want to change. It has the, uh, the auto refresh thing going on, which is really nice. Uh, Um, so I, I set up my text editor to be semi-transparent so I can see what's happening in the back. Um, so this is kind of cool. I mean, a lot of you probably know and do this already, but I recently had to fix some Android bug and I was amazed how, how, bad, that, um, how bad it is to create uh, Android apps. Everything is slow and you have to build things and it's, it's ter terrible. But um, Let's see, I'm, I'm on this page. Uh, let's say I take subscriptions for, for the fan club, right? And then let's say I want to add, I want to add a new field. Let's say I want to know where people are coming from. <coughs> and as long as, as soon as I save it, this thing is refreshed and you can see in the back, you don't even have to, you know, go like a caveman and click refresh here, all right? <laughs> <laughs> Everything happens in the back. I, I see that there's there's warnings, which also show up in the console. If you don't want to look at two windows, all right, you can have this thing open and it gives you the same error messages. Uh, yep, that that's about it about create React app. It's it's really nice, pleasant way. And then then you run React build. If we can do this, uh, npm run build. And it creates, yeah, it minifies and packages all the stuff. And then uh, it, it, it generates, let's see, you can see this bigger. It generates one JavaScript and one CSS files, and everything is minified and uh, ready to go. Let's see, where were we? Saki. All right, so <laughs> what have we learned today? First and foremost, if you didn't get anything out of it, just don't panic, relax. There's, uh, there's tons of options out there, but there's a lot of things you can do yourself or just start with something, something small. It's really enjoyable um, developing React applications. It's kind of addictive even because you kind of get into this flow of making little things and things happen all the time. Uh, you can try types uh, if, you, if you want to prevent as many, if it's a large code base with a lot of people working on it, you kind of want to take all the mm, all the steps that you can in order to automatically catch uh, things before they hit the production servers. And try create, a, create React App. Let's see, I have six minutes. Whoever wants to ask a question gets a book. Who goes first? Do you have a book? <laughs> <laughs> sure, <laughs> please come in. Hacking <laughs> book. Well, Hacking the context. All right. Uh, okay. Who's next? <laughs> I also have a non technical question. All right. I noticed one of your actions is called recuperate line. Uh -huh. Are you a fan of the sim? No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, but this is just a, a joke that um, a lot of people use. It sounds right. funny, right? Okay. Sure. <laughs> All right. All right. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. so in this case, this was a very simple example of um, you're just getting started and you want to prototype something quickly, but as, uh, as the application grows, then you, get a, you can have several stores, right? You can have as many as you want. One is responsible for, let's say, user information. One is responsible for, you know, this sort of data. Oh, how do you find your magic stuff? Most of the times you just read code. 
Yeah, yeah. There's uh, I, I didn't cover this, but there's uh, escape latches provided by React, so you can always go back uh, and communicate to the to the rest of the application. Right. So th the app, the, your big page creates a diff or something that says, "Hey, React, do your thing here." Right. But uh, but you have um, like all the things like the uh, the synthetic events as well. You can always go back to the browser event if you need to. You just never have to. So yeah, there is a. It's in documentation. I just haven't used that in since I don't know when, so I, I don't remember the top of my head, but there was a way to, <laughs> to do that. All right. And oh my God. <laughs> Go ahead, please. Uh, was it slow again? Like, is it different from Flux? Yeah. Sorry, I forgot I have to repeat the question. How is flow different than Flux? Yeah, they both are f f and Yeah, I get confused too. So um, let's see if I can do it right. So Flux is the idea of the architecting the app so the data flows in the same direction, in the direction all the time. So store, action store, view, action store, view. And um, uh, this was Flux, right? And flow is just annotations in your functions, right? It's not really related to React, but it's there if you want to use types like in Java um, and say, OK, this is my argument, it should be a number. No, it's not. No. Flux is not part of React. Flow is not part of React. It's just auxiliary uh, developments that happen to work together well. Do you have five questions already? Sorry. Go ahead. Yep, I am right now. <laughs> I am right now. So people are using it. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, you always try to use the, the pure components, right? So that um, that your your data inside of your inside of your render method, you always have uh, the same place to just look for data and state and properties, right? So you always try to have those. Uh, otherwise, it's kind of unpredictable if inside of your render method you suddenly have function calls, it can return whatever. Right? So it just makes it easier to um, think about the application and and the data in there. All right. All right, so I'm sorry, not, not everybody gets the book. We only have five, so the first five people, I think, <laughs> come in. And thank you very much, and we can talk after. Thanks.